So first I had an education in biochemistry, biophysics, and then switched to medicine, being a biology teacher in a normal school, and uh, getting my money by this job. And then I switched to psychotherapy also. So um, in my lifetime I combined different approaches to medicine, and uh, I'm mostly interested in this combination of a scientific approach with this uh, naive um, way to understand objects as if they would be self-explaining and given as such, and the hermeneutic approach, which is in use in psychotherapy. You would not be able to do psychotherapy if you would not be able to discuss the attributions that a person makes. So, person-centered medicine is basically um, medicine that also takes care of the attributions that people make that come to us and including our own attributions. In Heidelberg we have a long tradition of cooperation between both scientific and medical and philosophical uh, institutes and so there has been a chance to discuss the combination uh, or better to say the split between these two methodological approaches of science on the one side and epistemology and hermeneutical approaches on the other side within a setting uh, uh, of the Philosophical Institute in Heidelberg. And this is what we've done uh, 20 years ago and we worked hard to find a joint language um, that would be able to bridge the gap without, we tried at least, being naive. Uh, we discussed before that medical approaches usually and scientific approaches also are philo philosophically naive and the way of attribution is discussed in the uh, theological field of hermeneutics which is, uh, has a very, very long tradition. So, we met in a philosophical institute and we, that is, uh, among others, uh, a physiologist, biochemistry, mathematics, medical informatics, uh, and so on. And we then cooperated with uh, researchers um, specialized on uh, effects of uh, experienced stress on childhood asthma. This is a group in uh, London and Glasgow. They found out that after having experienced stress, children that suffer from asthma before uh, will have an asthma attack immediately, uh, more than expected, more than without stress, but they also have a second asthma attack six weeks later. So this might be put as a purely immunological uh, issue, but in fact uh, you must know how these children experience their settings and if they experience them as being stressful or not. So, these are typically uh, um, psychological questionnaires like the self-reported health where you also have a focus on how something is experienced. experienced. And this how it is experienced gives a lot of information about uh, both the social setting of the person and how ex it experiences it, it and its inner life, so to say, uh, or his inner life. Okay, so we tried hard and we could not manage the problem uh, only with uh, words because words, they are descriptive and luckily they are not exact enough otherwise we would not be able to talk to each other. Um, so uh, they are not precise enough to have a really good bridge for these two basic methodological approaches to be combined. We used instead an approach that um, first structured 
what happens if a person, a person experiences and interprets something and then what happens later in form of causal change, uh, chains. Let me have this slide. I will only have two slides. And uh, you see the last figure here. This is one person. You may, may say person one and person two. And there comes something like a source or a driver, as Joachim called, called it, um, that goes from the body and the feeling and the experiences and is uttered in some words or expression of the face and so on. And the next person needs to in interpret these, uh, these states. It cannot directly interpret the feeling. It must refer to the utterance. And to interpret this utterance, it um, hypothesizes that it might be this feeling. So the feeling coming up in the second person, the interpreting f person, is a hypothesis about the feeling, the potential, the possible feeling in the first person. This is a very simple process that goes uh, in, in infants. It does not need uh, a speech or anything like that. Uh, they feel, even our dogs feel <laughs> Uh, how we move and how we express our feelings in our face. So, so that's a biological uh, heritage, do you say? Heritage. Okay. And now uh, to better understand what is done with these states that are experienced and then interpreted, we have a new definition of states, a dynamic one, which means that only repeated change, changes of states are uh, worthwhile to be kept in mind. This has been said often before here in the lectures. So uh, for us, information only comes if a specific change of a sta state is repeated and leads to the same final status. So, now we start a logical interpretation and we see, well, we have a state one and a state two. This is our transformation and there are logically just three options how this can be go on. The one is from start to end. The other is the way back from end to start. And the third one is nothing changes. Start remains ch start, okay? This might be interpreted as an iteration of the start status. Okay, with this trick, we had mathematicians in our group. You have a so-called mathematical group. How many mathematicians are here? <laughs> okay, any mathematician will smile and be happy if he hears something about a mathematical group. That leads to set theory and so on, so on, so on. And if we combine this, uh, you have at the basis these three processes start to end, end to start, start to start and they are attributed to a source of these transformation that is stable over time and from this sort, a source these transformations will repeatedly done. Okay. So this is a very structural and strongly, strictly formalized approach to interpretative processes. In fact, we talked a lot about science, but nowadays immunology is a hermeneutic science. If you see the body as a machine, this is wrong. And this is also wrong from a scientist's point of view. Nowadays, anyone talks about effectors and receptors and the complete immunological and neurological communication is in need of interpretation, of correct attribution of transformations to a source. So,
the benefit of the high abstractiveness of this model is that we can refer both on science and on person-centered medicine because we do make a hermeneutic job if we do not want to be computers. And now I would like to have the next slide, maybe you help me. Now I transform that directly to person-centered medicine with being person one is the doctor, person two is uh, the uh, uh, person we deal with, I would say, not patient. <laughs> um, and then we have this same interpretative process once again. Great, thank you. You have here person one, patient, person two sh should be the family doctor, and once again the patient tells something about how do you feel, how do you experience your health status, and the doctor hypothesizes about what might be within the belly of this person or in the mind and the emotional status. Now, uh, um, research has shown that our uh, momentary emotional status or processes are, uh, have basically three contributions. Only one third is by ourself, one third is by the environment, and one per third is by the person we are talking with or are together with. So the family doctor, if we look for him, then he has three contributing sources. The one is the patient, the one is the further environment in that moment, if there's noise, or uh, children are crying in my private practice, for example, and only the third is he himself. And these converge within the emotional momentary status of the family doctor. And uh, to see the structure in more detail, we have this transformation change, chains which we have defined in mathematical terms also. And so we can say family doctor's momentary emotional status as source converges and is realized from transformation chain number one, two, and three. And we do have a clear definition of transformation chain. So I'm at the end. One word. <laughs> I'm too quick. It's fine. Okay. One word to the transformation chain. This is simple and it should be simple. Anyone can count to three. Okay? One third my own belly, my own mood, one third environment, one third patient. Actually these things are combined as sets with a number of elements and these elements interact. But you can in this mathematical approach combine elements on a controlled way to sets. And this is the good thing with it. So, in the end, we are neither understood by scientists <laughs> nor by medical persons, but that's fine also. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I've done, Chairman, is, is uh, make a slight change in the, in the presentation title. Uh, really to reflect uh, everything we've been talking about today, and I'm, I'm asking, is, is uh, asking the, uh, the question, which I hope we can answer, uh, is, is person-centered healthcare uh, a discourse or a master discourse, and does it have a lexicon which is well established or one which is actually um, currently uh, in emerging? <clears throat> So really to ask the question, is, 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 do we have a, a discourse in how, as academics, we understand a discourse? Well, let's see. A, a discourse, I think, in academic theory is a way of talking, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of acting that puts the talking and thinking into action. Another characteristic of, a disc, of an authentic discourse is that it has a vocabulary, a clear vocabulary, it has values, it has displays, and also ways of acting. Typically, uh, discourse analysts say there are three principal means of, uh, types of discourse. Type one, which is expert discourse, for example, the inter interpretation of law or medicine itself. 
There are, type two is a public discourse where the public talk about, you know, is there a war on terrorism or does, it, does that not make sense, etc. That's another discourse, type of discourse, a public discourse, type two. And then type three discourses are discourses on discourses. For example, on the strengths and weaknesses of evidence-based medicine or person-centered healthcare, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if person-centered medicine, person-centered healthcare is a discourse, I would argue that it's probably type one, but a sub-discourse, a, a sub-discourse situated within a much larger type one discourse, which is, or asks the question, how should modern medicine think and act? So in that sense, I believe person-centered healthcare to be a, a, a subtype uh, of type one. How should modern medicine think and act? There are reasons for the emergence of discourses. Um, really, uh, there is the, they tend to start with the identification of a, what is called a, in, in philosophy a founding problematic, or an, an FP. And an FP is not a simple problem, but a, really a problem set uh, with a suggested response. It's commonly driven by also an ideology, but ideology in the non-pejorative uh, uh, sense. Um, let's give an example. Evidence-based medicine, for example, one, claimed that only a minority of medical interventions could be justified by statistical data, and two, that this deficiency needed to be corrected by privileging certain kinds of knowledge, science in this case, above others to enhance medicine's scientific status. So one and two together constitutes the problematic, the problem set and how uh, we could, uh, or they could deal with that. Vocabulary and lexicon are and lexicons are central to um, uh, uh, discourses. And so what I put together in a sort of almost like a Sesame Street uh, A to Z uh, is uh, some suggestions about what currently constitutes the current lexicon uh, of person-centered healthcare. It's by no means uh, it's, it, perhaps it's a little extensive, and I'll aim to go through it fairly quickly for that reason, um, but it's by no means uh, complete. And so really, I think what I have here is, is uh, significant evidence of an emerging um, lexicon, an emerging uh, way of, uh, of talking uh, to each other. And of course, different, these different words will mean different things to other people. Uh, shock will mean one thing in medicine. It'll mean another thing in uh, uh, to an electrician, for example. So even a single word will mean different things to different people. Uh, but this is what I'm suggesting uh, uh, from looking at the, what has been written so far in person-centered healthcare uh, is the, the emerging lexicon, the, 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 the terms that we tend to use uh, more than any others. Uh, you, you, you can already see for yourself w what I've come up with under A and B just from looking at what people say in these papers published on person-centered healthcare. Abandonment, for example, uh, where we, uh, as part of uh, as part of decision making, we say, "Oh, you know, patient-centered care. You make the decision. Uh, I'm just a simple provider of goods as the doctor. Uh, you make the decision, and, I, and I'll give it to you." Now, that's really not shared decision making. That's almost abandoning the patient to his or her own um, consumerist choice. Uh, I would argue. Rather, for example, term two, accompanying is actually accompanying the patient, not abandoning them, not telling them what they must actually decide to do, which is paternalism, but actually accompanying them. And that's very important along long disease trajectories, such as long-term chronic illness, accompanying the patient uh, 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 with time as new symptoms emerge, uh, uh, as others are contained and so on, and responding to that fluid state uh, within the disease trajectory of a, any chronic illness, really. Uh, active listening is another. Adherence, we all know. Agency is a term uh, used uh, uh, already today. A new word that's entered the lexicon recently, anthropocentri uh, anthropocentrism, uh, uh, really uh, focusing very much uh, and, uh, on the patient in, a, in, a, in an active and philosophical way. Anthropology, the art of medicine, autonomy, we've talked about today as well as sick autonomy, and B, uh, person-centered healthcare lays great store by the biography uh, of the person. Uh, biomedicalism is another term that's been used in the literature, and uh, an obsession perhaps with biomedicine uh, as the cure to all ills at, at the expense of uh, the elements of the biopsychosocial model. Uh, burnout uh, is something that Professor Stoyanov will be talking about tomorrow. Uh, burnout and flameout. <clears throat> and a C, there seems to be a great deal. You can see caring, Cartesian dualism, uh, chaos theory, non-linearity non and so on, clinical judgment which we talked about today, Mayor Goldberg talked about it, the clinical encounter between two people at the center of care as Stephen uh, talked about, uh, clinician directed care as opposed to patient directed care as opposed to, sh uh, as opposed to shared decision making, flame and burnout, 
the issue of comforting the patient, of uh, being compassionate to the patient, not looking at the patient as a complex biological machine, uh, complex systems thinking, as Carmel and Joachim have already talked about, and complexity thinking, as they've talked about, the whole issue of consoling, uh, the whole issue of consumer and consumerism, which Stephen talked about in the context of the patient-directed care of the typical North American model of patient-centered care, contextualization, uh, the use of science in the context of the individual patient, particularization, contextualization, continuity of care, which we're often perhaps not good at, uh, coping, teaching the patient to cope. I mean, there are copers and non-copers, some people in between, but uh, uh, I think clinicians can teach a great deal uh, uh, through um, cognitive and other therapies of how to cope. Cultural sensitivity. And the D, uh, diagnostic categorization. Uh, I think doctors like to put people into boxes, uh, particularly, uh, latterly, the, the DSM-5, which has come under much... Uh, a controversy for putting people into little boxes as opposed to seeing how those boxes fit together and what it means for the patient. Uh, dialogue is something that has not, perhaps not constituted much uh, interaction between doctor and patient and clinician and patient in, in, in the former years, but is now uh, featuring highly. Dignity has been mentioned. Doctor-centered, doctor-directed care, the old model perhaps, which is now giving way to the, uh, the, the two people at the center of care model. Under E, we see a lot empiricism, empirical justification, empathy, empowerment. These are words already been used today in the discourse today. Epistemology, again, ethics, ethos, the ethos of medicine and healthcare, uh, uh, the concept of an expert, i.e. Uh, someone who just doesn't, like a computer, apply uh, statistical information to the individual, but actually interprets it contextually, uh, and that requires expertise and experience. Uh, evidence, what is evidence, would we call it knowledge, rather than evidence equating scientific knowledge. So uh, e evidence-based medicine we've talked about today, as opposed to evidence-informed medicine, the foundationalist and non-foundationalist arguments that Dr. Markham has talked about, the concepts of, the concepts of excellence, uh, which could mean the use of science in the context of the whole person as opposed to technical competence, which could be, the could be the application of clinical guidelines only, for example. Existential pain and crisis. G, well, one word I came up with, generalization, uh, which medicine does well, particularization perhaps less so. H, health facility design. I think that uh, many of our health facilities, particularly the older facilities, are not particularly person-centered. Uh, but rather they've been built for um, the operation of older systems and uh, staff uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, conveniences and so on. Health literacy, uh, teaching and educating the patient in order that they can prepare for the consultation properly, something we already talked about a little earlier. We talked about already the hierarchy of evidence uh, of EBM, the vertically ordered hierarchy of evidence, in contrast, for example, uh, to the horizontally ordered library of knowledge sources which P PC uh, PCH would look at. Uh, that under the hierarchy, where, evidence is, where medicine is based on evidence, uh, you know, m one locks clinical practice within the, e the epistemic cage of biomedicalism, uh, whereas PCH says, oh no, well, science is only one form of knowledge. Let, let, let's, let's take this hierarchy and just collapse it uh, into a horizontal ordered library of knowledge sources, and let's draw from a knowledge of values and narratives and science and cultural background in the context of the individual. Um, so uh, humane, humanism, humanistic, humanitarian. Uh, Mayer talked about how these words have been used in, in the 70s and 80s and, and 90s, for example. Uh, illness versus disease, the disease being the primary uh, pathology of pathologies, giving rise to a constellation of other subjective uh, experiences of illness. Which, so we now say, well, okay, disease results in a broader illness. If we talk about disease, we're talking about a medicine of, the, of an organ. If we talk about an illness, we're talking about a state of the individual. Uh, integrated care, uh, for example, comes to mind health and social care, for example. Uh, um, in integrated diagnosis, realizing that a, di a, a diagnosis may have to be remade and remade and remade and remade over the course of a chronic illness because the, the illness is unstable and changing. So diagnosis can't be a signal, once only event at the beginning. It has perhaps to be a continuous event. Integrative diagnosis, interpretive exercises, clinical judgment, and this very dirty word for many people, uh, intuition. But as human beings, we have it, and it has a place in clinical practice. Much contested, but there it is. It's in the lexicon. Um, hastily, hastily added by PowerPoint uh, uh, over lunch was the concept of joyful caring, which you see under J um, uh, from Stephen's presentation this morning. Uh, under K, kindness. 
the issue of knowing and knowing and, uh, and knowledge, knowledge-based care, which uh, Clifford talked about earlier, knowledge-based care as opposed to evidence-based or values-based or um, cultural context-based, foundationalism again. So knowledge-based knowledge -based care or knowledge-informed care or, no, or, or, or knowledge-using care perhaps. L, life events, we all have them and they have profound consequences in, in, uh, for, for health. Um, uh, linearity versus non-linearity, uh, already looked at by Carmel and, and Joachim. Uh, lived experience that, uh, um, that Maya talked about in terms of phenomenology. M, mechanistic thinking, which medicine is very big on. Mind-body medicine, which um, I think Lynn uh, um, referred to when she talks about the psychoneuro-immunological uh, uh, endocrine axis, uh, whereby it is now empirically shown by hard science that what goes on up here is affecting things right down to the level of the lymphocyte in a way that we never uh, appreciated before and which was seen as highly suspect when we talk about mind-body medicine. But now we're seeing it as a real empirical base. Um, in some ways, uh, that takes me back to uh, what um, uh, Clifford said when he said we're, we're relearning things now that we sort of knew 400 years ago. Uh, but there we are. Uh, moral character, uh, we learned from um, James Markham uh, that medicine really is a, a, a human endeavor with a moral character and multidisciplinary team working. It's no longer about the doctor, it's about the doctor and the nurse and the psychotherapist and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And person-centered healthcare is not gonna work if it's just a part of a, med, a, a small medical-led uh, team, even in the community, even in the community. So multidisciplinary team working is, is, is essential. N for narrative, narrative-based medicine, narrative-enriched medicine, if we want to get away from the, 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 the based uh, argument again. Uh, neighbours, now neighbours, this is very interesting, uh, the neighbours refers to the clinical relationship. Um, you can't really be friends with your patient because there are ethical problems, and you really can't be a stranger because there are ethical problems with that. So Catherine Montgomery, in particular, has talked about the clinical relationship being one of neighbours. Uh, you're not a friend, you're not a stranger, but you're someone who's actually concerned to take care of that person and watch out for them when they're on holiday or when they're ill or, or whatever. So she talks about a, a medicine of neighbours, for example. This has entered the lexicon. Non-foundationalism, as James has talked to us about, uh, has entered the lexicon. Non-linearity, as Carmel and Joachim have already talked about. O for objective observation, measurement and assessment, always a, a part of medicine and, and, and very um, important, but not so important that it should ignore the subjective and the subjective experience of illness. Ontology, which Lynn has talked about, organicism. P for particularization, uh, which is what we haven't done well and what e EBM hasn't really succeeded in doing. Uh, paternalism, which we always used to do, uh, but we do less. We talked about patient and uh, the, uh, the Latin origin of the term and whether we should be using that patient or people or people living with a particular illness. Patient-centered care uh, in the, uh, 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 as opposed to person-centered care, uh, which Stephen looked at. Patient-directed care, the North American model. Patient-reported outcomes, as Carmel has looked at. Uh, the concept of the person and, and what is a person in bioethics. Uh, what is personhood? Uh, James talked to us about personalism and its various forms, whether secular or Catholic. Um, phenomenology, which uh, uh, May has talked to us about. Phrenesis, practical wisdom, a la Aristotle. Um, positivism, uh, EBM we've talked about, uh, uh, preferences uh, which are di distinct from values, patient preferences and how they should be taken into account as part of reaching decisions with the patient uh, in a form of preference based or preferably preference informed healthcare. Uh, presencing, now this is something that was used a lot in nursing, the idea that actually being present, a doctor or nurse being present with the patient undergoing a procedure gives tremendous comfort and studies have shown this. Uh, presencing, I interesting. Uh, we frequently don't pay enough attention to the psychology of the individual, so psychology is part of the lexicon. The psychosocial status of the patient is perhaps not always uh, measured. Uh, patients often present with psychosexual problems in HIV or breast cancer or ovarian cancer, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or, or, or some of the other chronic illnesses, Parkinson's, for example, and so on. Another neglected area of care because perhaps it's a bit too difficult to talk about or embarrassing for patient or sometimes doctor as well. Uh, Q, quality of life, that, that is a term that's been around a long time and has been contentious in terms of how it's measured. And quality of death, uh, well, this is very important as part of palliative care, a good death. And doc doctor should, and I'm not talking about euthanasia or physician uh, su uh, 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 assisted suicide, but I'm talking about care at the end of life and what that means, uh, quality of life, a good death. R, relationship ba uh, based centered care. Uh, a lot of work was done uh, by this in Rochester. Uh, by Frankel and Epstein and others, and it's now making a bit of a comeback. 
Um, respect, we've heard about today. I'll go through quickly because I'm conscious of the time. Under S, you can read for yourself. Salutogenesis is a term we've, used to, we've heard about today. Scientism, scientific reductionism, we've heard about today. Scientific knowledge versus other forms of knowledge. Uh, Self-care, um, unless I've missed it, hasn't so far uh, been talked about today, but is part of the lexicon. Um, in fact, perhaps it's been talked about um, indirectly because in teaching the patient to self-care they become more dependent on themselves their own agency as opposed to on clinicians uh, but also clinicians have to self-care in order to protect themselves against flame out and, and burnout and, and their own in ill health in, in the face of dramatically increasing workloads service reconfiguration has been talked about ah that means five minutes right. service uh, reconfiguration uh, <laughs> has been talked about uh, in order was particularly Salman Raf you know that we, we have to change the way we're doing things we have to change the system service user is not a term I like to use at all uh, sick autonomy, shared decision making, silo medicine is a term that Lynn used. Uh, social, the social functioning of the patient when we discharge them for, from our, from clinical practice is something perhaps we don't we don't think enough about. Spiritual care is something we don't think enough about. The subjective experience of illness has already been talked about. Suffering is something that has not uh, been given enough attention. Sympathy. Very quickly, and a T, tacit knowledge, for example, the therapeutic relationship of clinician and person together, trust unique clinical circumstances, values, n realizing that the values, are, values come from patients, clinicians, health systems, and society. So it's not just the values of the patients that matter in, re in reality. There, there, are, there are values of all these people, and they have to be negotiated. So uh, values-informed medicine. The concept of vocation in healthcare, as <laughs> I think has been lost, uh, and bringing it to an end, well-being, wellness, worry, and worries. And my last slide, Chairman, is this, to answer the question. I would contend that Person-centered medicine, person-centered healthcare appears to have all of the necessary attributes of a successful discourse in the way the discourse is uh, understood in the academy. Uh, I think we have an effective, informed, committed, and energetic leaders, and I mean that, con that's, and we have many of them in this room. We have an identifiable discourse community, and it's increasing in size. The society membership, for example, is going up and up and up, and these SIG chairmanships are going up and up and up. We have visible structures, the society and associations and so on. We have publications, we have journals, we have books, um, and what uh, Miles Little in Australia calls iconic texts and so-called master discourses. And for the last uh, this, um, one minute, we have educational uh, activities, conferences, training courses, logos and letterheads and so on. And we have a clear definition of the problem and a strategy to address it, the so-called problematic that I talked about at the beginning. So I would argue uh, that on the basis of this short presentation, that we have a lexicon already, which will enable us to debate uh, more clearly and I think that it's far, far from well established, uh, but that it is in fact rapidly emerging. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, well, first of all, I think I, I think I am the last the last one. Okay, I, I guess that everybody is very tired now, so I try to be person centered. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why I'm asking you that to be person centered with me because my English is not so good as the previous speakers, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, well, this previous session has been, the, has been devoted to, to, to clarify what this person centeredness and person centered care, does. and I think in a very, really reflective way and very clear sighted. So in my talk, I am, uh, I am intending to focus on person-centered communication. So considering this as the communication among uh, clinician, patient, and family members that promote patient sentiment. So while well, I think that most of you will agree that uh, from the classical point of view, uh, uh, this operational definition of, of, of person-centered, of patient-centered care might include these elements. But I, I am a family physician, so my concern is, for me, the problem is how these communicational objectives can be achieved in an effective and significant manner by a doctor in a medical encounter. Well, well I, I'll give my opinion about this, okay? And uh, I, for that, I am going to take in, uh, into account uh, two current conceptualization trends on communication. So one of these is the, the first one the, is, uh, is the, the emphasize the observable behaviors. And uh, 
the acquisition of skills and the application of qualitative and quantitative coding scheme to the observed behavior of physician and patient. I am naming that as transactional approach, okay? So the second emphasizes uh, the intangible experience. This includes trust, emotional support, and consensus conflict between the participants, but also the physician's reflection, self-awareness, and transformation. This has been called uh, the relationship dimension, communication as a way of being, and uh, or relationship building. I am naming that as interactional approach. So although, of course, it might seem obvious that the two trends must be related approaches to teaching and, uh, and, and research often emphasize one and ignore the, the others. And in practical terms, uh, the consequences of these conform different and recognizable uh, clinical style. So let, let's go with the first uh, uh, task of making a diagnosis. I want to invite you uh, to watch some initial second of some actual clinical encounters from primary care here in Spain, okay? Let's go. Mm -hmm. 
Well, what have you, what have you seen here? <laughs> Lots, of <different> Lots of different things. Lots of different things. Okay. Well, looking at these initial moments of these clinical encounters, I would like to invite you to watch them as different declaration of private experience. Private experience that I communicated, and in doing so, share it with the doctor. This is the S of our SOAP scheme. I realize this experience for each of the, of the patients may have a specific meanings. To interpret these meanings, I should come even minimally in the context of their lives. That means their lives plan where the experience makes sense. And surely and generally, since somehow it's treating them. So my first task as a person-centered physician should be twice, I think. On one hand, to address both individual experience and meanings, and in an imaginative way, try to find out the meaning in what patient experience in present. On the other, making my relationship with the patient a creative alliance, an alliance where the possibilities outweigh the imperatives. However, what the doctor usually does, instead of focusing on the patients to imagine as a person, is changing our immediately imagination about the possible disease that the particular patient has. We often say this, there is the patient and there is the disease. But look at this scene. What are you seeing? What is the disease? Although it's not the case, if we look at the real encounter, here we have the patient and the doctor. The disease is woven into the patient's predicament, and it is working in the doctor's imagination. There is no disease-specific wavelength of communication. Then, for the clinician to understand the encounter, does not begin with to understand the patient needs not to hear what he, she say and fit it into a category of disease or problem. Because listening is not just a passive transfer of information from patient to doctor, it is a task requiring imagination to reach out for the meanings in what it say. To avoid the patient being referred to the background of the inner consultation, doctors need to attend fully to the patient from the moment of silence that opens the consultation. They must make the patient the target of their imagination. That is the most important communication and challenge that any doctor has to deal with. But for a long time, doctors are not too interested in understanding experience and meanings of their patient. We didn't spend much time talking to patients or thinking about their feelings. We focus on diseases. And we pursue technical excellence, a technology that tries to mend bodies a thought for understanding disease. Well, our goals are those that appear here in this slide cure rates, remission rates, complication rates, and so on. Well, we have defined this as clinical outcomes. And the way we are incorporating and using the communication is in this way, just as a skill. I mean, as tools for getting these clinical outcomes. We are listening just as a passive transfer of information from patient to doctor, just as the behavior that allowed me to get more precise information about the disease. And in doing so, our first target still is the disease and the clinical outcome, but not the person. From this perspective, maybe a good strategy for cha changing the doctor's mentality is to define new kinds of outcomes. What if we call experiential outcomes? To these outcomes belong the galaxy of feeling, impression, meanings, and values that arise from our endless experiences, and the way they impact on our projects and our uh, identity as a person. So we will need a kind of existential communication. <coughs> and turning back to the clinical practice, what we have in front of us are the symptoms presentation. Look at the patients and the way they convey their complaints their faces, gestures, words, tone of voice, volume, even the content they are priorita prioritizing. As uh, my friend Carl Rudebeck has highlighted, 
in his phenomenological study, the symptom presentation's role is twofold. First, the patient gives words and meaning to their experience, and they are inviting me to use my interpretative imagination to share their experience. So the core of symptom presentation are their experience. Body and lives are inseparable. Why do I see a doctor? The logic of her body experience is always existential. Understanding is also based on common experience and intuition. So, as human, the doctor knows very well, very well this logic, and should be ready to understand it. I want to use this quote of Maya Angelou, who, by the way, passes the, passes the way only one month ago, to exemplify what existential communication could be. So, to reach the people feeling is to reach the core of the person. Making people feel means imagination about the patient, again, not about the disease, during the whole consultation. We have a word for this, it's sympathy. It is not possible to understand an emotion without having an idea about the experience that evokes the emotion. Yes, <laughs> are, you, are you agree? <laughs> Do you agree with me? <laughs> Perception, emotion, and cognition are integrated dimension of any experience. <laughs> we have prepared without seeing your slide. <laughs> imagination about the patient is imagination about understanding who is the patient, what are the patient experience, what are meaning on her experience, and this is no sympathy. In this sense, a Spanish primary care secretaries, Jorge Tizón, named empathy as the first doctor stethoscope. The concept of empathy brings the doctor-person relationship to the core of medical act and put aside the task, imaginative and speculative, of categorizing problems or generating hypotheses. But also, this is the prerequisite for a latest successful categorization and recognition of the patient's problem and needs. Me, as general practitioner, usually do first a binary categorization uh, viral versus bacterial, uh, functional versus organic, medical versus uh, surgical, and later a more exhaustive differential diagnostic if this is really needed. So person-centered medicine is to consider the practice, as my mentor Ian McGuinney said 40 years ago, to consider the practice as the really basic science of medicine. And this brings the need of making a big change of medical education. Well, there is not much left time, but I try to outline something about the management decision, okay? So I would like to bring your attention now about the type of medicine that our patient increasingly demands us, a tailor-made medicine. And again, I present you uh, Angelina Jolie. I think this morning has been here, okay? <laughs> well, you know, in May 2030, actress Angelina Jolie announces something extremely new in the New York Times, My Medical Choice. She told the world that she had recently had surgery to remove both her breasts, a double mastectomy. She was perfectly healthy. It was a preventive decision. I think this is a good example of personalized healthcare based in genomics. But let me know, please, uh, a most usual uh, situation for a clinician. And this is a Spanish, uh, a Spanish the, the opinion of a Spanish diabetic patient. A mí me hubiera gustado que hubieran eh, intentado conocer mejor mi estilo de vida para que me ayudaran a mejorarlo. Uh -huh. No que me hubieran enfrentado a una especie de estándar eh, que además no correspondía con mi caso. Uh -huh. Y es que si el estándar está hecho sobre un tipo de población, yo no me identificaba con eso, porque andar 20 minutos para mí no era un referente. Si tenía que hacer eh, más deporte, tenía que hacer más deporte y al contrario pues eh, eh, ponerme una dieta de tal nivel pues no tenía que ver con, con, con lo que sabía yo en eso sí que, que, que echaría hubiera echado de menos eh, un intento de conocimiento del estilo de vida me imagino que con las limitaciones de tipo de circunstancias que te dieran indicaciones personalizadas de cómo mejorar well mm. I have just uh, I'm not sorry, please. Well, 
Well, personalized health care is not just about advantage genomics, of course. It is particularly important in, in, the, in our clinical practice, but particularly in primary care, where in chronic disease, but in multimorbidity, for example, very common. We may differ in genomics, but we, what we mainly differ each other are in preferences. As in uni unique human beings, each one has or should be or should have their own preferences. Of course, in the realm of treatment, the tissue and statistic evidence are very important for doctors and we really need them. But I insist once more time on the consultation is a quite acquittance of particulars. And, became, be, and because of that, we should be using this kind of evidence just as to be informed by and not based, based on uh, the tissue on it, as previously has been highlighted. This means that shaded tissue making process should be mainly focuses on our information exchange where effective evidence-based option and the risk and benefits must be displayed to the patient, discussed and applied for making decision in a very automatic way. Instead, shared decision-making process should facilitate it that the information to be shared be the right quantity, not insufficient, not overload, relevant to the patient situation, to this particular patient situation and meaning of this patient should be a process that promotes a deliberation, including explicit exploring option and their pros and cons, and implicit elements, feelings of the patient, and also what is the personality of this, of this patient, as well as the degree to which these preferences are articulated or tested, clear or nebulous, stable or unstable, informed or uninformed, while should be a situation facilitated individuals can clarify or bolster each other's thinking, compensating for deficits in each other's ability to process information and to solve problems. So this means to conceive the shade that is making also as a process in which doctor needs to imagine not about evidence, but about the person again. Here again, a sense of connection, attunement, understanding must be reached, and this will be the precondition for calibrating patient needs and preferences. I have just tried to draw on how empathy can help clinicians to grasp and understand the nature of symptom presentation. Well, I think it helps the clinician as well for acknowledging and adjusting for effective components of information and for adequately engaging patient in care. I am just finished here. Let me now show you, for, for in conclusion, to, to show you some of the conclusions of a phenomenological study we performed some years ago. So using transcript from primary care consultation, we illustrated how relational factors are really necessary precondition for an efficient and efficient decision-making process. Because in the, in, the, in the interaction, in this interaction, empathy, trust, rapport were necessary con uh, to consider a complete list for a complete, for consider a complete list of options. Because in many of the situation, the, uh, the, the number of, of options were ambiguous and because new acceptable options were sought only when prior options were considered inadequate. So in the consultation, a complete deliberation often was not accomplished due to the limited attention span and exhaustion. And achieving effective uh, cohesion about the nature of the problem made arriving at consensual derived action plan much more straightforward. Well, so because uh, uh, most of clinical encounters uh, and not only those where serious decisions must be taken, a situation predominantly emotionally laden and cognitive demanding. Also in this realm, the first stack for a clinician and patient need to be engaged in, in collaborative regulation of cognitive and emotional load. So for a physician to get relational autonomy, trust in relationship and personal knowledge must be our priority aim. And this, with this precondition, I think technical knowledge uh, and evidence can be much more successfully applied. So thank you very much. <laughs>